Okay, tēnā koutou koutou. Welcome to another of the stimulating Friday afternoon seminars at the Department of Public Health. And it's my particular pleasure to welcome Lucy, who um, joined Hekai Ngoranga, the Housing and Health Research Programme, um, as a doctoral student way back when? <laughs> 2005. 2005, and has remained um, with the group, finishing a very distinguished I'm doctorate and then I'm working on postdoctorate and now as a senior research fellow in our group. And um, she has a, a really interesting combination um, based largely on her anthropology um, degree where she um, did work actually in Chile and with Chile, Chilean migrants. Um, so she's a very useful Spanish speaker in our group. <laughs> uh, but has many other skills, both um, uh, quantitative skills in particular, uh, but also um, sophisticated policy skills and networking skills. And um, when we, in our latest, in our last uh, housing and health research program, uh, when we were looking at um, um, five areas, Lucy was as in charge of one of the areas, which is the area of the rental warrant fitness. And we had made a big emphasis in our group to look that any research we, that we do should get translated into policy, and we were very keen to try and measure that. And those of you who've done that kind of thing know it's quite tricky because it's crowded stage. But nevertheless, it's been a very interesting journey, and um, Lucy's going to reflect on it for us today. Thanks, Lucy. Right, is this working? It was working before. Can you hear me at the back? Yes, yes excellent. Uh, kia ora koutou. Now, I need to get this bit to work. Um, I'll work it like this then. Okay. Uh, it usually comes at the end, but I want to start with acknowledging the Health Research Council who funded the Rental Warrant Fitness Study and much of the other research referenced in this presentation. So thank you, HRC. The Rental Warrant of Fitness sits at the intersection of housing and health in that it's a tool for prioritising physical improvements to housing with priorities set so as to improve health outcomes. Today I'm going to take you through both the evidence and policy environment that led to the WAFS development, describe the current WAFS study as planned and as it actually happened, and reflect on our experience in converting health evidence to public policy and on what comes next. There's a bit of storytelling involved in all of that, so before I tell that story, I want to set the scene with the contents of our Rental Warrant of Fitness. The Rental WAF is a 29-point checklist covering basic insulation, ventilation and dryness, fixed heating, amenities, state of repair, and safety hazards. These are the 29 points here. Uh, you don't have to read them all. I'm not going to go through each of them because that would take too long, but I'll whip through their broader categories in the next few slides. We have amenities necessary for safe food and personal hygiene, and the dwelling being in a reasonable state of repair. We require fixed heating in the living room, means of ventilation, and a basic overall thermal envelope, including insulation. The property needs to be free from mould and damp. And finally, over a third of the criteria and are intended to prevent injuries like slips, trips, falls, burns, poisoning, or even physical assault in the home. So that's the content of the Rental Warren Fitness. I'll come back to it later, but for now, I'd like you to turn your minds back to the start of the 21st century, the year 2000. Um, internationally, President Trump was just a joke in a Simpsons episode. Um, the Twin Towers were a popular New York tourist attraction. Here in New Zealand, we'd been the first country to see in the new millennium. Helen Clark was just starting her time as Prime Minister. Um, and the big news stories of the year were the awful death of Hine, Hine Waoriki Lilibing Karai Tiana Matiaha, which mattered, and Black Magic winning the America's Cup, which didn't. Um, as far as our housing conditions went, they were barely on the radar, either for the public or in policy. There was some government recognition of the need to do something about poor housing for Māori and Pacific people. There was no broad awareness of the overall inadequacy of our housing stock. Leaky homes were still being built and we didn't know it yet. 
Renting was perceived as a temporary arrangement, a stopping point between leaving home and buying our own home. Although a proportion of people renting had crept up from just over a quarter in 1991 to nearly a third in 2001, we hadn't really noticed and we probably thought the increase was just going to be temporary. As a nation, if we knew there was poor housing, we thought it only affected a small group of people, mostly tertiary students, as illustrated here, um, and only for a short period of time. <clears throat> Brands had started measuring housing conditions, but their surveys only included owner-occupied properties. The state of rental housing was largely unmeasured. So with people generally unaware of our housing quality issues and renting seen as something temporary, there were few requirements to maintain or improve standards of existing housing or to ensure tenants' rights to decent homes. There were the 1947 Housing Improvement Regulations, which required homes to be free from dampness and to have basic amenities and an approved form of heating and to be in a reasonable state of repair. Those regulations were almost forgotten and they were not considered for enforcement. The Tenancy Tribunal took the view that an electric socket in the wall was enough to satisfy the heating requirement. Um, and the main piece of legislation on rental housing, the Residential Tenancies Act, required only that properties be in a reasonable state of repair, taking into account the age of the property. Housing was not framed as a health environment, and New Zealand evidence for the role of housing and health was limited. That was about to change. Over the next eight years, uh, the Housing and Health Research Programme, Hei Kaingoranga, produced a range of evidence which gradually convinced the government and the public that warm, dry homes mattered. Insulating homes improves well-being and reduces school absences with a benefit to cost ratio of four to one. And replacing unfluid gas heaters with energy efficient heaters reduces asthma symptoms and events. Michael Keel's work on home injuries also showed that spending just $800 on home modifications to fix safety hazards reduces injury by 26% with a benefit to cost ratio of up to 37 to one, I hope I get that right, which will become relevant later. The response to this new evidence, and to be fair, a lot of lobbying, um, helped by also by a greater interest in improving energy efficiency for sustainability reasons, was the 2009 Warm Up New Zealand Heat Smart Programme, which provided subsidies for retrofitted insulation and energy efficient heating. These subsidies continued despite the change of government, um, that in fact were part of the agreement between the Greens and, and the national government when they changed. Motu were then contracted to evaluate the Warm Up New Zealand programme, and we carried out the health segment of that eva evaluation, finding that it reduced hospitalisation costs and also reduced mortality in over 65s with previous cardiovascular hospital hospitalisation. The benefit to cost ra ratio was estimated to be between four and six to one. On the downside, the evaluation found that the benefit to cost ratio was greater for insulation than it was for heating. And the government came to the perhaps logical conclusion that it was best to put all of the budget into insulation rather than heating, and so it just became Warm Up New Zealand, not Warm Up New Zealand Heat Smart. Yeah. 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 That's true, yes, yes, it was a small sample. In the meantime, with the hope of improving the standard of rental housing, we had also been working on developing the rental warrant of fitness. Uh, back in the early days of Heikai Ranga, we needed a tool to identify what was right and wrong with housing. We spent a lot of time going through the evidence and working with brands and other housing researchers to develop the Healthy Housing Index. This is an illustration of pages 40 and 41 of the index inspection booklet pretty near the end, but I think they show how detailed the index is. It takes at least a couple of hours, sometimes longer, to get through it all. Um, <clears throat> we considered using the Healthy Housing Index as a tool to improve the standard of rental housing. Um, it is a very useful research tool, um, and I think we're still using it in, in injury research, but with so many questions and taking a that length of time um, for each inspection, it wasn't really going to be practical as a nationwide rental housing intervention. There are about 450,000 rental households in New Zealand, uh, even in a smaller city like Dunedin, which uh, has about 13,000 rentals, it would take about 25 years of working hours to inspect them all if you use the Healthy Housing Index. So, 
We worked with the New Zealand Green Building Council to bring the Healthy Housing Index down to a 31-point checklist, which we took to pre-test in 2014 in five cities around the country. Um, a few tweaks after the pre-test brought the checklist down to those 29 items that I showed earlier. The pre-test showed it to be practical, taking just under an hour to complete and, in most houses, and workable across a broad range of New Zealand housing types. Only 4% of properties passed in the pre-test, um, but the properties were inspected as is, with a landlord um, who was volunteering, and so it may not be representative of New Zealand landlords overall. Um, we wanted all rental properties to be required to pass the warrant of fitness before they were let, so that tenants would know the property was habitable at the start of their tenancy and not have to enforce standards themselves through the tenancy tribunal. Now, um, in, as the Warrant of Fitness study was starting, in 2015, Coroner Shortland released his report on the 2014 death of Emilita Bourne of a brain hemorrhage as a complication of bronchopneumonia. In his report on her death, the coroner stated, I'm of the view the condition of the house at the time, being cold and damp during the winter months, was a contributing factor to Emilita's health status. So I think it's fair to say that at this point, the general public were now drawing the link between cold housing and poor health and recognising that homes should be warm and dry. 2015 was also the year Michael Keel published his home injury prevention study. Um, and also, Sarah Beer and Mark Bennett published a study on how the Tenancy Tribunal was using and interpreting housing standards. And the Rental WAF study proper began. The study was originally designed as a non-random community trial in which a mandatory warrant of fitness scheme would be introduced in Wellington, Porirua and Dunedin council areas with Lower Hutt as the control city for Wellington and Porirua, and Invercargill for Dunedin. The main aim of the study was to address the question of unforeseen consequences. While the WAF was built on solid health evidence, the next step in evidence collection was to ensure the intervention had the desired outcomes without adverse ones. Could the Warrant of Fitness improve health and injury rates and mean tenants weren't having to move because the housing was shoddy? without leading to higher rents, less rental availability, or increased homelessness? Would there be other social or economic benefits not directly related to health or rental tenure? And we also wanted to make sure the WAF was going to be a practical policy intervention on a large scale, and that it could be introduced in a way that was cost neutral to councils while also doable for landlords. So would they be able to um, comply within mandatory timeframes and so on? We had our outcome measures planned, health data from the national data sets, economic data from TradeMe, um, and from ECA, and, um, and both of those were willing to share data. We'd also identified a range of social outcomes to consider, student um, turnover in low decile schools, rates of homelessness, tenant mobility, landlord and tenant experiences. We had a nice equation to show we had a proper theoretical model for the effect measurement, looking at the difference in outcomes between treatment and control cities before and after the intervention. And we had further study questions, particularly around how to address the policy barriers which at the time prevented the nationwide introduction of a mandatory scheme. We planned extensive consultation with every government department we could think of who might have an interest in factors related to housing, the rental market, residential rental business, um, community organisations, churches, NGOs, and likely business and service providers, insulation and building material businesses, the insurance industry, to make sure that we were asking the right questions. We wanted to be confident, or as confident as possible, that when the study was complete, if anyone asked, but have you looked at this thing that means that I object to the idea of mandatory world fitness, we can say, yes, we have, and this is what we found. Um, that was the original design. This is what actually happened. Um, we did carry out the consultation and that was hugely valuable and identified additional outcomes, landlord insurance claims, ACC claims, um, and um, tenants rebound into social housing after a period in private rentals. That but went swimmingly. Uh, the first sticky point was how to make the warrant of fitness mandatory. 
And then while we were starting to think about that, Pororua decided that this was a central government problem and that their council was too small to afford to fix it at a local level. That was fine, we still had Wellington and Dunedin. Um, and then other implementation challenges appeared. Um, we'd initially thought that there could be two options for a mandatory WAF. You can have a local bill put forward by a sympathetic MP or a, um, or a bylaw. However, our advice was that a local bill wouldn't work because, as Pororua had said, um, poor quality rental housing was indeed a, a nationwide problem, so it couldn't just be addressed with a local bill. And a bylaw wouldn't be legal because the Local Government Act prohibited councils from requiring more than the Building Act. We also had practical challenges of working with Dunedin from a distance and questions around who should do the inspections, who should train them to do the inspections, how bookings would happen, and so on. Those were easier to manage. So our next plan was to start voluntary and move to mandatory once we'd found out a way to do it. Um, the more immediate problem was the question of how to make it mandatory was turning out to be quite problematic. We looked at the option of enforcing the war on fitness as a way of enforcing existing housing quality regulations, which do cover a good proportion of the war on fitness, if you include those housing improvement regulations. Um, but we had to set that aside as well because of difficulties with enforcement. So um, councils are a bit like vampires in the nicest possible way. They don't have the right to enter and inspect private property unless someone's made a formal complaint. So they wouldn't have the right to check a property had met warrant fitness standards unless the landlord or tenant invited them in. Um, in the meantime, some more evidence-based policy happened. Um, the evidence for insulation from the initial studies and the warm-up New Zealand evaluation, along with the increased public awareness, led the government to introduce new regulations under the Residential Tenancies Act, requiring all rental properties to have smoke alarms almost immediately and to have insulation in accessible ceilings and underfloors by July 2019. It wasn't quite to the standards that were in fitness set, but for most properties it was going to be an improvement. We expected the insulation requirement to be a solid chunk of the health impact of the warrant fitness. So that um, 2019 requirement for all rental properties to be insulated gave us a tight window for measuring um, an effect before our control settings would effectively become part of the treatment category. Our next proposed design dealing with the um, um, mandatory issue was to take what we call the pseudo-mandatory approach. Um, so we propose that councils could have a new rating category for rental properties with the rate set at a much higher level than owner-occupied properties, probably about $3,000 or higher or so, which is about how much it costs on average to bring your property up to off standard. Um, if the landlord could produce a current rental warrant fitness certificate, they'd get their rates rebated back to the same level as owner-occupied properties. So it was still technically voluntary. They could make the choice to pay a higher rate, or they could spend that money on upgrading their property and getting the assessment done. And we were a good way along that path. Um, the voluntary warrant fitness had been launched in Wellington, lower Lower Hutt had decided actually they maybe did want to be involved. So Porirua were looking like our control city for Wellington. Um, we developed our assessment app, um, now available for public use. This is my house here before it was painted, um, partway through its assessment. And it includes information for landlords and tenants on their rights and responsibilities as well. And yeah, our government changed, <laughs> um, which was great. They made it clear in the first 100 days um, that they'd be passing the Healthy Homes Guarantee Bill into law. And also around this time, or over, over this last period, the Tenancy Tribunal had started applying the housing improvement regulations that was following um, Sarah Beer and Mark Bennett's paper that, that I mentioned earlier. So that's kind of brought us up to the present. Um, we've seen our research bring policy change across all three arms of government. We have changes in policy in the executive arm with the insulation and heating subsidies and local government equivalent with the launch of the voluntary warrant fitness scheme. We've seen changes in the judicial arm with the tenancy tribunal returning to enforcing the housing improvement regulations. 
and we've seen changes in the legislative arm with regulations and laws changing to reflect housing and health evidence. At the same time as we've developed our understanding of the range of health effects and the costs associated with poor housing, I think we've contributed to growing recognition of the problems with New Zealand's housing stock. Um, there are still an estimated 800,000 homes with inadequate insulation. Brand surveys now measure the difference between rental housing and owner-occupied housing. And there's better evidence for the reality that rental properties are in worse condition than owner-occupied homes which shouldn't be too surprising. We have split incentives for home maintenance, um, the tenant benefits, but the landlord bears the cost. Property prices rising faster than inflation mean landlords have not needed to maintain their homes to maintain property values. And the increase in shortage in housing supply relative to demand and lack of housing standard regulation or enforcement has meant landlords have not needed to maintain their homes. Meanwhile, the number of people renting has continued to grow and that's been, um, in, in the public consciousness as well. There's growing recognition that renting is not a temporary arrangement and that the renting population includes more people than just students and that those most vulnerable to ill health, particularly children in poverty and others at the less advantageous end of the social determinants of health spectrum, are more likely to be in rental tenure than to own their own homes. So if we go back to the, the 29 WAF criteria, um, the revival of the housing improvement regulations deals with 13 and a half of those. And the 2016 regulations address another one and kind of half of two more. And although the draft regulations for the Healthy Homes Guarantee Act aren't yet released, we have reasonable ex expectations that they will strengthen some <laughs> um, and address another two. <coughs> and another half of two other ones. So we're kind of, we're getting down to, a, we, that leaves us with about a third of the warrant fitness points which are unaddressed by legislation or, um, that's coming through. All but two of these are injury hazards. Um, the, the ones here prevent burns, poisoning, trips and falls, um, protect physical security in the home and access for emergency services. So in our timeline for translating research evidence into policy to improve health in homes, there are two outstanding issues. First, although we've had strong evidence for the benefits of home injury interventions for about the same length of time as the evidence for insulation and heating, apart from the new requirement for smoke alarms, we've still got more work to do to achieve the same policy impact for home injury prevention as we have had for indoor warmth. Second, Although, again, we've had good policy changes recognising the need for better standards in rental properties, we're still battling in the question of enforcement. Tenants really deserve to know that their home is going to be warm, dry and safe before they move in, not have to move in, figure out what's wrong with it, and then have to make that choice about whether they're going to muddy their relationship with their landlord and get themselves a tenancy tribunal record, which might make it difficult for them to, to rent in future, um, in order to get that fixed. And, and so the full burden of enforcement falls on the tenants. There is, um, in the Healthy Homes Guarantee Act, it does beef up the enforcement team for the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, but that's still quite um, unclear. And at the moment they have, I think, 13 staff for the whole country, which isn't really enough when we take into account just how widespread um, housing issues are. So to get through to those, on, on those two points, the injury hazards and the enforcement question, we know that the evidence alone is not enough. The sort of research we do provides health evidence and some economic, economic evidence and even a bit of legal evidence as well, which combats the lack of information and economic barriers and some of those questions around the legal barriers. But we need more lobbying and science communication particularly in the enforcement area and in the injuries area. And in the enforcement area, we probably also need more research and evidence to get through to our um, next steps, um, which are ensuring that the Healthy Homes Guarantee Act standards are of as high a standard as they can be, and also addressing, addressing the, the major gap of home injury hazards. Um, and 
that's rattled me through. I thought I, I thought with, with 59 slides we'd be here all afternoon, but, um, but I've taken you through them very quickly. So that should leave plenty of time for questions. Anyway. Identify yourself when you ask a question, please. Thanks, Lucy. That was fantastic. Um, and I just love the history of where we've come from, um, having lived in a Scarfie flat. Um, <laughs> What I was not entirely certain about is what's the status of the of the research project at the moment? Yes, the, well, the the last report to the health health research council was we're kind of a bit stuck in terms of the um, the you know treatment control the standards coming and we don't know when they're going to come into effect. Um, the appetite from the councils to proceed has waned as I've seen that there's been a um, legislative requirements instead they thought well, you know, we don't need to do any more. Wellington City Council has said there's the act coming in, we're happy to leave it as a voluntary scheme for now. Um, Dunedin City Council, they're, they're st are still interested but maybe in a different way so they want um, Red to Warren Fitness assessments on all of their properties and they're wanting to have their staff trained to be able to do that. So so there are there's a still interest in, in ensuring that properties meet the rental off standard but but again not in uh, maybe not in the kind of the way that we envisage as this nationwide tool to ensure that tenants know that the property's going to meet that standard before they move in. Um, and so in terms of our research project, because it also had that sort of policy barriers aspect to it, we're now into the stage of, okay, well, we're going to look at what, what are the barriers to bringing in those last bits of it, the enforcement questions and, and the injury questions, in order to ensure that the whole of the warrant fitness intent is brought through into public policy, even if the means of doing it turns out to be slightly different. Would that be fair? <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe can I add a... Yes, sure. Um, so Lucy's been very busy on this, even though the formal experiment has sort of morphed. Um, we've had lots of councils um, contacting us. What can you, you want to name someone? Yeah, so um, Palmerston North City Council have also looked, been looking at um, having the Warrant Fitness as the standard for their rental properties. Whether, um, so Julie and I presented to them um, late last year uh, and also early this year. Um, we've done training in Tauranga because the local um, the equivalent of the Sustainability Trust in Tauranga wanted to be able to do assessments in their local area. So there's still, and there's, uh, you know, every other week I, I get inquiries from people still wanting to do the training. So there is still that demand out there, but it's just kind of figuring out what that's, how that's going to work and what that's going to look like in a slightly different policy environment. Yeah, and we're, we're still, well, we've got Lucy and I called in this afternoon to MB and final tweaking of Healthy Homes Guarantee <laughs> Act. Um, so we are constantly talking to people about that. A and it's, it's part of a longer and really interesting discussion about shifting from a country where we don't like regulation at all and we particularly don't like enforcing regulation to actually thinking about let's tie things down and let's actually see if they're properly implemented. Do you think you'll win the, the um, most amazing policy impact, impact for research that wasn't actually ca carried out? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, and, and it's that, that thing of, of you know, kind of, I, I have people saying, oh, so does that mean they've, they've gone ahead of the evidence? And I say, well, no, the, the, this policy changes are happening are based on the same evidence that they're in for and fitness. So it's not ahead of the evidence. It's just kind of um, ahead of, of where we thought we'd be, I guess. And so it's them leaping ahead has meant that our research has had to change significantly here. My question leads on nicely from Caroline's that the 
impact, of course, of this is immense. I'd really be interested, though, in your reflections on the process at the beginning of getting the funding from the HRC. So quite rightly, you've done a ecologic type of study where you've got whole communities because you want to assess the effect of changes in rentals on supply, yada, 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 yada. When you got funded from the HRC, you then had to go and work out how you're actually going to get the intervention in place, which makes me think backwards a bit as to what did you say in the original application to the HRC? Yes. What and what, no, no, I've, got, I've, got, I've got several okay. questions. Uh, <laughs> what did you say in that original application? What did referees say in response to the fact that I assume you couldn't guarantee it was going to happen? I don't need to answer all these questions, but you can see where I'm going here. Yeah. What are your okay. reflections on the process of getting this really important research done where it's hard to know where the intervention is going to happen? You know what I'm asking. Yeah. So the, the important thing was that in the actual HRC application, we didn't say that we were going to measure the effects of introducing mandatory bond fitness. We said that we were going to measure the effects of announcing that we were going to introduce a mandatory <laughs> bond of fitness. Um, because we because we could do that and we could guarantee that that was going to happen we couldn't guarantee that you know I mean obviously we had um, we had a lot of goodwill um, and we were fairly confident that we would be able to do something but yes as you're quite right we couldn't guarantee well, what did the referees I, the HRC I would have say? To say uh, pass that on to Filippo in terms um, they like that. They liked the fact that we were trying to actually take um, descriptive and analytical work and actually have an impact on policy and try and work out how to measure it. Uh, I should say there were a sort of slightly unforeseen things that happened, like we had spoken to all the parties and um, we were hoping that the University of Otago would be a big player in the private rental market in Dunedin by sending out signals that the university considered this really important part of their town gown and it started being positive and then went the opposite. So there were there were things that there are things that we can't control, much and all as we try and control as many things as we can. So um, and and of course the change in election and stuff. So we've learned things from it, but it's not, you know, the outside world's not as tidy as and jumping we would to the other end and the last thing I promise. What does the HRC say now? I, um, they must think this is great impact, but I'm but, curious but we, as to what they say. Yeah. Uh, well, we've only just submitted our last report, and it was only really at that point um, that that we've said we needed to kind of change the, the focus of where we go from here. So we haven't had that feedback yet um, on on what what their view is of that. I would hope that. Um, that we've really demonstrated that we've had the effect of introducing most of the warrant of fitness without doing the research and that, that's kind of um, that's sort of the same thing only not um, from the health research council point of view not quite the same thing but but there is still um, a lot of research I get a lot of publication um, opportunity in the description and discussion of that whole of that process so it's not a kind of it's not that the research is, is dead it's just that you talk about it in different ways and and take a more policy or, or um, yeah I guess more of a policy of approach a more descriptive approach about the barriers that we encountered the the research experience rather than the, do the study what are the outcomes yeah. And, we're, and we're still hoping that the rental warrant fitness is one of the preferred ways of actually demonstrating that people have met standards. And there's, of course, some big commercial opportunities here now, and so other people are moving into that area. So it's getting more and more complicated. Um, yes. So I don't know how you're Uh, kia ora, uh, Shay Nahu from the Cancer Society of New Zealand. Thank you for that. Um, actually, I'd just like to say also, I recall some of this journey that you relayed back there, back in pre-2000s, actually, with the uh, Healthy Housing Stuff in Counties Monaco, I think, Philippa, you were a long time ago, and that was related to meningococcal outbreaks and such like, so it's great to see the progress. Um, I've got a slightly different question for you, wondering, uh, the, so the Healthy Housing Guarantee, that's still related to rental housing? 
Healthy Home Housing, uh, Healthy Homes Guarantee Act is for rental housing here. So I'm wondering if you foresee a time where the rental housing stock will be of better quality than the <laughs> own stock because I'm wondering if all the private homes will have as good of insulation and uh, like as that. Um, I, I think that you might reach a point where there was greater variation in the quality of, of owner-occupier stock than there was in rental stock. So if all rental stock is required to meet a basic standard, then you probably get a sort of a lump of, of housing that's, that's at that standard and just above, and then a, a few of the more kind of executive properties and so on. Whereas owner-occupier properties, yes, there will be some that are in really rough condition and then there'll be a lump that is kind of a bit better than the average rental property standard and probably more in the higher quality space as well. That would be my guess of where, where you'd end up. If that answers the question. Hi Lucy, thanks very much. Uh, I just think um, drawing some parallels to smoking as usual. Um, <laughs> but I, I just think about the, the ITC project which Nick previously led in New Zealand and we've got a version of it now which is a cohort of smokers who have followed up over time um, to see how their behaviour changes but also how it impacts of policy and other interventions which you're not certain what, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, could there be something similar for setting up a cohort of people in rental um, properties and following them up on the assumption that there's, there's going to be things happening in this space but you're not quite sure what so setting up the, the sort of experimental thing you know, it may not work but you're pretty sure that there will be things happening and it might vary somewhat between different parts of the country and so on so you could sort of monitor and, and su surveil what's going on and, and try and um, yeah, that, generate that, data on the impacts and so on Um, yeah, well, I was going to talk first that, you know, that's a very interesting idea. It sort of follows on from the idea which, um, in some work with Shaw at Massey, that talked about the kind of the housing career that people have, you know, where they go and rental housing. They may own their own home. Sometimes they, they sell and, and rent again. Um, and, and so having a, some sort of prospect of study of, of people's housing careers would be, would be a really interesting thing to do. Um, the denominator question, Philippa, I'm not quite sure what you... Well, the, the, one of the main problems is we don't know who actually... We don't actually know who are the renters in New Zealand, so we can yeah. do this sampling. And, and Lucy was an honorary MB person for a while trying to um, work that out, and I wondered if... Yeah, there, there are some challenges in working out who's renting. Um, so about... We do have the tenancy bond database, but um, only about 80% of landlords collect a bond. This is based on the survey that Shaw did, and only about 80% of those, not only, 80% of those um, lodge the bond. So you end up with a, a solid chunk of the rental market where you don't know whether they're renting or not. I mean, I suppose you can go door knocking and so on. There are ways to address that, but if you're doing it for study purposes. But when you're doing the kind of the, the broader scale um, studies it, and using the IDI and so on, you can lose a bunch of, of people who are renting um, because it's hard to identify them. People even are not very good at identifying on the census whether they rent or not. Um, there are a bunch of people who we know who are in Housing New Zealand properties who say they're not renting. So, um, yeah, that's kind of messy. Yeah, thanks very much, Lucy. Uh, a question about the... Um, issue of it's quite unusual for New Zealand to have, pick up a new policy that isn't used elsewhere is there international evidence that you leveraged into the uh, discussion and you know do other countries have rent warrant fitness uh, they uh, in the UK they have the um, healthy was it the housing safety housing safety and rating scheme um, which is uh, now required for rental properties and is enforced by councils that's kind of been happening at a, in a similar sort of time frame to this. Um, there are some states in the US that have different standards requirements for rental properties as well. So there's the whole Section 8 thing in the US where you can get a housing subsidy um, if you're on a low income and only um, properties which meet a certain standard qualify for um, Section 8 subsidies. So, yeah, there's... That evidence helped 
you think, influence in New Zealand? Certainly, the, the, the UK stuff certainly helped. Um, yes, you know, we were able to say we're not the only, we're not alone in doing this. But, but the, the stuff with insulation, I think, you know, New Zealand was more alone than not having insulation. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of a different sort of object. Um, thanks very much, Lucy. And it was just what the comment about homelessness being one of the the things that we had up there is the the ill effects. That one of the the odd effects that we've had by having the rental warrant of fitness in the app is that in housing first now, which is nationwide rollout, the all the NGOs are using the rental warrant fitness app to say is this suitable to put a homeless person in or not. Um, so it just it's kind of in a mire of. The non of indirect causation. Uh, well done, really. Yeah, thank you. And that's um, that's an interesting point because when we released the app, we had to make this choice, and we're working with Wellington City Council. We had to make the choice of whether we would collect um, information on who had, who was getting it, or who, and what sorts of results they were getting. And Wellington City Council were quite keen that there not be any record of um, what people re were recording on their own houses. And so we made that decision that it would, you know, it would be an optional voluntary download and we would not collect any data other than the fact it had been downloaded. So we know how many downloads there are, but not who's using it or what sorts of results they've got from their own assessments of their properties. And that was a real thing that we had to give away because, of course, of research, as researchers, you want all the data all the time. Um, but, but we had to just kind of let that go and accept that that was necessary for public confidence and, and people being willing to use the app. And, for the greater good. And they're worried so, about liability. Yeah, so they and that too. They were worried about liability if they knew things were substandard and then something happened and they could be prosecuted at a la leaky building. How many people downloaded the app? Do we know? We're up to Julie, I think. Yeah. About like, last time we looked, about a thousand. Um, a good chunk of that was, was in Wellington and when it was launched. Um, but we continue to see downloads and whenever there's a little burst of publicity about it, then we get another. Oh, and Watson, just a question. Um, has there been any modelling on rental supply after the thing is in, in force? Well, because it hasn't been enforced, we we can't do the modelling on the rental supply. We, we had been intending to, and we um, were working with TradeMe, and they had said they were willing to share data with us so that once it was being enforced, then we could um, measure whether there was any effect on supply. That's the whole point about modelling is doing stuff in advance of the... Oh, I, you mean, yeah, um, not, not by us, I think. Um, our, our view was that there, there shouldn't be any effect on, on supply or demand. Um, but, you know, that was the point of the study, really, was to test that. And, and, and that's what, if it was, you know, Sukhlov type, if it was, um, if it was mandatory and everybody had to do it, we didn't think it would affect supply. Now we've got this rather sort of patchwork system. So um, we're, we're, we're aware of that, but we like to do sort of empirical work and sort of modelling for projections. Well, we have had kind of increasing landlord standards over over a period now, and and yet um, the, the pr proportion of properties in rental tenure has not gone down in response to that. It only creeps up. So, any burning last questions? Any, anyone from online? No other hands. Well, I think you'll agree it's been a very stimulating talk. Thank you, Lucy. It's quite some memories um, that you've taken us through there. <laughs> and, um, and thank you very much. And thank you to all the people in the group who contributed to it and you for coming along. Thank you.